from New York, this is Democracy Now! Julian Assange revealed the truth about U.S. matters, about what they were doing, about the war in Iraq and Afghanistan, and about the treatment of people. He revealed the truth. British MP and former Labour leader Jeremy Corbyn has traveled to Washington, D.C., where he's calling for WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange to finally be set free and for Britain not to extradite him to the United States. We'll speak to Mr. Corbyn in D.C. Then we go to Atlanta, where the battle over a new police training center has turned deadly, as police fatally shoot a forest defender protesting plans to build what's known as Cop City. Gunfire was heard at 9.04 a.m. About a dozen shots fired in rapid succession, followed by a loud boom about a minute later. For hours after the murder of Portuguita, police continued to hunt, assault, and arrest our brave forest defenders. And we speak to Black Lives Matter co-founder Patrice Cullors about the death of her 31-year-old cousin, Kenan Anderson, a 10th grade English teacher who died after being repeatedly tased by the LAPD. He was one of three men killed by the Los Angeles police within 48 hours. All that and more coming up. Welcome to Democracy Now!, <clears throat> democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. The Biden administration and some of its European allies have pledged new heavy weaponry to Ukraine, including howitzers, missile defense systems and first-time shipments of armored vehicles. On Thursday, the Pentagon said its new $2.5 billion military aid package will include dozens of Bradley fighting vehicles and striker-armed personnel carriers. The Pentagon stopped short of shipping M1 Abrams battle tanks, as Ukraine had requested, and Germany has so far refused to send Leopard 2 tanks sought by Kyiv. In Moscow, Kremlin spokesperson Dmitry Peskov warned the U.S. and NATO against arming Ukraine with tanks. This is potentially extremely dangerous. This would mean taking the conflict to a new level, which, of course, will not bode well from the point of view of global and European security. Meanwhile, The Washington Post reports CIA Director William Burns traveled secretly to Kyiv last week to personally brief President Volodymyr Zelensky on Russia's military plans in the coming weeks and months, particularly talking about a potential spring offensive. In Peru, thousands of protesters demanding the resignation of interim President Dina Boluarte took to the streets of the capital, Lima, Thursday, where they were met with brutal force from riot police and swirls of tear gas. This was the sixth straight week of mass protests since the ouster and arrest of leftist President Pedro Castillo in December. Over 50 people have been killed in clashes with Peruvian security forces. This is Jose de la Rosa, one of the protesters in Lima. We want the usurper Dina Bolarte to step down and call for new elections. The protests will continue. The south of the country is in an uprising at the moment. We came to Lima from all the southern regions. Baluarte spoke at a news conference Thursday where she praised police and accused protesters of instigating violence and chaos. No es. That was not a peaceful protest. The violent acts that occurred in December and January will not go unpunished. In France, over one million people marched in the streets of cities, including Paris, Marseille and Nice, on Thursday, as labor unions held a nationwide strike against plans by President Emmanuel Macron to raise the age of retirement from 62 to 64. In Paris, more than three dozen people were arrested after police tear gas protesters from Bastille Square. This is a trade union leader, Laurent Escure. We want to have a good retirement. We don't want to retire broke, tired, broken. We want to enjoy our last years with our children, our grandchildren, maybe with our parents who have to be taken care of. So it is a message of social justice that we want today. If the government does not come to its senses, there will be more strikes to follow. That is why we appeal to reason and not to make the choice of irresponsibility and to choose the voice of reason. In the United Kingdom, unions have condemned a bill proposed by conservatives 
conservatives that would allow the state to break strikes of public sector workers by ensuring they maintain minimum services during work stoppages. Workers violating the bill could lose their jobs, their unions could be sued. Labor leaders have condemned the bill as undemocratic, unworkable and illegal. They're planning to mobilize over 100,000 civil servants in a one-day strike February 1st. Israel's Supreme Court has ordered Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu to remove Arieh Derry, the recently appointed far-right interior and health minister, saying he's not eligible to hold public office due to his multiple criminal convictions. This comes as Netanyahu's new ultra-nationalist, ultra-religious coalition attempts to disempower the judiciary. Analysts say the decision could either lead to a constitutional crisis or the dissolution of the week's old government. On Thursday, U.S. National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan met with Netanyahu in Jerusalem, where Sullivan reiterated Biden's bone-deep commitment to Israel. Sullivan also met with Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas in Ramallah, who called on the U.S. to put pressure on the new Israeli government to halt the killing of Palestinians and its plans to expand illegal settlements. The meeting came as Israeli forces killed two more Palestinians during a raid in Jenin Thursday. The victims were identified is 26-year-old Adam Jabarin and 57-year-old Jawad Farid Bawakta, a high school teacher, father of six, who was delivering first aid to Jabarin when he was shot dead by a sniper. At least 17 Palestinians have been killed by Israeli forces this year, including four children. The Harvard Kennedy School has restored its fellowship offer to Kenneth Roth, the former director of Human Rights Watch, after Harvard was blasted for rescinding the author over Roth's and Human Rights Watch's criticism of Israeli human rights abuses. Kenneth Roth appeared on Democracy Now! earlier this month to warn against the chilling effect of Harvard's initial decision. This is a very serious problem. I mean, it's not just a problem for me personally. This is not, you know, impeding my career in a significant way. But I think about, you know, first of all, the younger academics who don't have, you know, the visibility that I do, who are going to take from this lesson the view that if you touch Israel, if you criticize Israel, that can be a career-killing move. You'll get canceled. And that's a disastrous signal to send. To see our full interview with Kenneth Roth, go to democracynow.org. Colombia's government has pledged it will no longer award new contracts to drill for oil and gas, as President Gustavo Petro seeks to fulfill a campaign promise to transition Colombia away from fossil fuels. Colombia's Energy and Mines Minister, Irene Vélez, spoke Thursday at the World Economic Forum in Davos. We have decided that we are not going to enter into new gas and oil exploration contracts. This has, of course, been very controversial at the national level. But for us, this is a clear sign of our commitment to the fight against climate change, because we know that this decision is a planetary decision that is absolutely urgent and needs immediate action. In Brazil, two indigenous Patachó land defenders were murdered Tuesday in the municipality of Itabela. 17-year-old Nawir Brito de Jesus and 25-year-old Samuel Cristiano do Amor Givino were traveling to a farm when gunmen on a motorcycle shot them in the back, according to witnesses. The Patachó people have faced intense conflicts with local ranchers who've invaded their land. This comes as the government of President Luis Inácio Lula da Silva has launched a series of raids in search of illegal loggers and ranchers in the Amazon rainforest in an effort to halt deforestation, which skyrocketed under the far-right former president, Jair Bolsonaro. This is the anti-deforestation mission's leader. The rhetoric of the former government created a mindset among people that led many to invade areas and deforest them, planting farms and thinking that the government would eliminate indigenous lands and legalize these invasions for cattle production. Back in the United States, the Supreme Court said Thursday it is unable to identify the person responsible for leaking the draft opinion on Dobbs last year, which overturned Roe v. Wade, or the constitutional right to abortion. The court conducted over 100 interviews as part of the investigation in one of the worst breaches in Supreme Court history. At least 90 people had access to the opinion before it was publicly released. This weekend would have been the 50th anniversary of Roe v. Wade. Since the ruling was overturned, 12 states have enacted total abortion bans. 
In Texas, prisoners across the state have been on a hunger strike for 10 days to protest indefinite solitary confinement. In some cases, people have been held in solitary confinement for decades. Human rights groups, including the U.N., have said the practice amounts to torture. In New Mexico, prosecutors in Santa Fe are charging Alec Baldwin with two counts of involuntary manslaughter over the killing last year of cinematographer Helena Hutchins by a loaded prop gun on the set of the film Rust. The film's armorer, Hannah Gutierrez-Reed, will also be charged with involuntary manslaughter. Baldwin's lawyers vowed to fight the charges. SAG-AFTRA, the union representing many Hollywood actors and other film and media professionals, also condemned the decision to hold Baldwin, who is also a producer on the film, responsible for Hutchins' death, saying, quote, an actor's job is not to be a firearms or weapons expert. Google's announced plans to lay off 12,000 workers with immediate effect, affecting about 6 percent of the company's workforce. Google's CEO announced the layoffs this morning, just two days after Amazon and Microsoft announced layoffs affecting a combined 28,000 people. And the legendary musician David Crosby has died at the age of 81. The singer, guitarist, songwriter was a pivotal member of two of the most influential bands of the 60s, The Birds and Crosby, Stills, Nash and Young. In 2011, David Crosby came on to Democracy Now! in the studio with longtime collaborator Graham Nash shortly after they performed at Occupy Wall Street in New York. He talked about his longtime opposition to nuclear power. The second part is that human beings make mistakes. That gave us Chernobyl. That gave us Three Mile Island. Uh, Mother Nature can kick our butts anytime she wants to. That gave us Fukushima. Uh, it's not safe. There are two plants in California right on the beach. One of them's on a fault line. It's 50 miles to windward of my house. I, I, I keep. I sort of looked that way to make sure I, could, I spot the plume when it happens. Uh, it's, it's, there's nothing safe about it, and there's nothing green about poisoning your country. During their appearance on Democracy Now!, David Crosby and Graham Nash also perform part of Crosby's song, What Are Their Names? Who are the men who really run this land? And why do they run it with such a thoughtless hand? What are their names? And on what streets do they live? I'd like to ride right over this afternoon and give them a piece of my mind about peace for mankind. Peace is not an awful lot to ask. David Crosby and Graham Nash in our Democracy Now! studios in 2011. To see the whole interview, you can go to democracynow.org. David Crosby has died at the age of 81. We'll play more of his music later in the broadcast. And those are some of the headlines. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. We begin today's show with British MP and former Labour Party leader Jeremy Corbyn. He's in the United States to take part in the Belmarsh Tribunal today in Washington, D.C. The tribunal is focused on the imprisonment of WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange, who's been languishing for close to four years in the harsh Belmarsh prison in London while appealing extradition to the United States. If convicted, Assange could face up to 175 years in jail in the United States for publishing documents that expose war crimes in Iraq and Afghanistan. Other participants in today's Belmarsh Tribunal include Noam Chomsky, Pentagon Papers whistleblower Dan Ellsberg, and Assange's father, John Sifton. Democracy Now! will be live streaming the tribunal at 2 p.m. Eastern at democracynow.org. I'll be co chairing the tribunal. The Belmarsh Tribunal is being held as pressure is growing on President Biden to drop the charges against Assange. Five major newspapers that collaborated with the WikiLeaks over the publication of the leaked documents recently appealed to the Biden administration to drop the charges. In an open letter, 
The New York Times, The Guardian, Le Monde, El País and Der Spiegel join together to say publishing is not a crime. British MP Jeremy Corbyn joins us now in Washington, D.C. Welcome back to Democracy Now! It's great to have you with us. The ple pleasure to be here, Amy. So, if you can talk, you've come uh, from across the pond, you've come from Britain, where Julian Assange is imprisoned. He's being held there because the U.S. has demanded his extradition, and it looks like they're in the final stages of making that decision. Can you talk about why you feel it was important to make this trip and why Julian Assange's case is so important? Well, Julian has spent his life as a journalist um, investigating uncomfortable truths and ensuring that they are published. And he's the one that exposed the war crimes that went on in Iraq and Afghanistan. And he did it because he believes that uh, we all have a right to know what our forces and our governments do at the end of the day in our name. He was then uh, sought by the United States under the Espionage Act. He took refuge in the Ecuadorian embassy in London, where he was for several years living there. Not a great place to be living. No criticism of the Ecuadorian president at the time. And uh, then the government changed in Ecuador, and um, he was then removed from the embassy, arrested, and um, placed in prison eventually. And he's now been four years, as you quite rightly say, in Belmarsh prison, fighting the extradition request from the United States. And uh, his conditions in Belmarsh are awful. It is a maximum security prison where he has to share his cell and his life with people who are convicted of very, very serious crimes indeed. We are standing up for the right to know. We're standing up for journalism, and the Belmarsh Tribunal today here in Washington is a plea to people, particularly in the United States, who believe in free speech, who believe in the right to know, who believe that journalists should be protected in going about their work, and to drop the appeal against the um, uh, decision made by a British court that um, he was not fit to travel and therefore it should not be allowed to go to the United States. And um, we are making that plea. We ask thinking people in the United States, thinking people who value the freedom of speech and freedom of the press, to speak out now in support of Julian Assange. And that's what we'll be doing this afternoon here in Washington. You met with uh, Bernie Sanders yesterday, um, <coughs> the uh, independent Vermont senator who just gave a major address on the state of the working class in the United States. Um, did you raise the issue of Julian Assange, and if you can share his position and what you talked about? The meeting with um, uh, Senator Sanders was um, entirely about industrial issues and class politics, and we had a good discussion on all of that. And uh, we discussed the wave of strikes in the United Kingdom, which you mentioned in your excellent news report, and, of course, the wave of strikes in France, and the need for the left across the world to be stronger in its anti-austerity politics, not just to manage our economies, but to change them. And how are you coordinating, um, as you are a part of Progressive International um, and so is Senator Sanders, how do you coordinate, strengthen that response? <clears throat> Uh, Progressive International is a coming together of progressive forces um, around the world. We're working very closely with people in Brazil, in Colombia, in Chile, in Peru, in Bolivia, and all over Latin America, as well as many European groups and people in other parts of the world. The uh, <clears throat> falling living standards in many countries as a result of 12 years of austerity in Britain have uh, finally met with big industrial actions, and uh, February the 1st in Britain will be a day of big industrial action. We're coordinating our message across the world, because essentially the economic thinking that is now being played out in Davos, the economic thinking that comes from the, <coughs> excuse me, 
International Monetary Fund and World Bank is exactly the same, that the way out of this crisis is to lower the tax, as it's called, burden on the richest people in order to create trickle-down economics. It simply doesn't work. What we're facing is a plethora of food banks in Britain. There are now more food banks than there are branches of McDonald's and increasing levels of poverty. And you know what? In all of the demonstrations of rail workers, mail workers, communications workers of all sorts, um, civil servants and teachers, many other groups join those demonstrations representing the poverty, homelessness, migrants and refugees. This is a campaign for social justice and decency and we of course coordinating it across national borders. Economic thinking doesn't stop at national borders. We mentioned at the top of our uh, news headlines uh, this union, uh, anti-union bill that's been proposed by conservatives that would allow the state to break strikes of public sector workers by ensuring they maintain uh, so-called minimum services. Workers violating the bill could lose their jobs, their unions could be sued. Um, can you talk about what you're doing in Britain? You're the former labor leader. You're still a member of the parliament. Yes, this piece of legislation has been produced in panic by the government, who are giving, if the legislation is passed, the Secretary of State powers to decide what are minimal service levels that must be guaranteed legally on railways, mail, teaching and so on, all, the, all those industries where le uh, strike action is being taken. It has gone through the first stage in Parliament where it was given um, its introductory vote, what's called the second reading vote in Britain, and it goes to the detailed committee stage on the 30th of January in Parliament. Parliament. We will oppose the bill because it's an infringement of the right to strike. We believe it's contrary to the provisions of the International Labour Organization Convention. And what it will do is put union funds and union officials and union leaders in legal jeopardy unless they obey an order to maintain a minimal level of service. And it will lead to the, ultimately, legal action being taken against them. We've been here before in Britain when, many years ago, the Conservative government government of Ted Heath in the 1970s tried exactly the same thing, indeed imprisoned trade unionists, and those trade unionists were re released because there was massive industrial action in their support. We're heading down exactly the same road at the present time. The government could solve this very quickly. It could simply accept that uh, those who work in all those key services have been impoverished by frozen or falling wages over the past 12 years. And poverty does stalk the land, and there are more billionaires than ever in Britain. There's more inequality than almost ever before in Britain. And what is your and there's a demand to change direction. And what is your response to the current <coughs> Labour leader, you are the former Labour leader, uh, Sir Keir Starmer, uh, firing a junior shadow transport minister who joined striking rail workers on a picket line? He was completely wrong to do that. The uh, principle of being a Labour MP is in the name. You are there to represent, yes, the Labour Party, but also the wider Labour movement. What Sam Tarry was doing, I was there with him, was on a picket line with some telecom workers outside BT Tower in London, as showing our solidarity with those workers uh, in a pay claim for, uh, for them with British Telecom. And you know what? They won that pay claim, and the strike was entirely successful. Sam and I were there and proud to be in support of them. And I just think the idea you would sanction Labour members of Parliament for supporting trade unions who themselves are affiliated to and help to fund the Labour Party is, I'm sorry to say, completely wrong. And Jeremy Corbyn, what about the war in Ukraine? What about those pushing for negotiation, for diplomacy, um, often <clears throat> criticized for being uh, Russian puppets? Um, yet deeply concerned about this, what could be a global conflagration, or even what's happening just alone to the Ukrainians. You have a thousand religious leaders in the United States calling for a ceasefire. Um, Bishop Barber, we played a portion of a speech where he said, the war is immoral, it is illegal. He fiercely criticized Putin, but said negotiation has to be the way. Your response? 
I welcome the call by a thousand religious leaders and many, many other people. And I've had a number of very interesting discussions all around Washington yesterday on the possibilities of promoting the idea of a uh, internationally organized ceasefire and negotiations. I absolutely and totally condemn the Russian invasion of Ukraine and the brutality that goes with it. And the destruction of life in the Ukraine, the loss of lives of conscripted Russian soldiers is awful and appalling. This war could drag on and on and on. More and more arms could be thrown into the conflict. More and more people would die and you'd end up with destruction all around. Surely to goodness, here we are in the 21st century watching in real time a conflict going on. Can we not do better than that? Call a halt to the conflict. Have negotiations and agree on a viable future. If Russia and the Ukraine can negotiate, albeit under the auspices in that occasion of Turkey, to ensure that grain supplies flowed out of Russia and the Ukraine through the Black Sea, which are very important to feed people in the, the Middle East and North Africa, then they can come together on lots of other issues itself. And so can we stop having armchair generals in all of our studios discussing how this could happen, that could happen, this could go on and that could go on, and this could be destroyed. Instead, raise the voice for peace and raise the voice for, the voice for hopes and justice. I support the Russian peace campaigners. I support the religious leaders that are calling for a more rational process. And I call upon the uh, leaders of the countries that are closely involved in this to heed those calls and find a way out of it. All wars end with some kind of peace conference. Let's jump to that stage. I also want to quickly ask you about Brazil. You were there when Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva defeated Jair Bolsonaro, observing the election. Earlier this week, Brazil's prosecutor general charged 39 Bolsonaro supporters in connection with the January 8th attack on the Brazilian Supreme Court, Congress, Presidential Palace, and the capital, Brasilia. They're charged with staging a coup and other crimes. The Brazilian president, Lula, condemned the attempt to overthrow his government by what he called fanatical fascists. This is what he said. All those people who did this will be found and punished. They will realize that democracy guarantees the right to freedom and free speech, but it also demands that people respect the institutions created to strengthen democracy. And these people, these vandals, what could we say? They're fanatical Nazis, fanatical fascists. They did what has never been done in this country. Your response, Jeremy Corbyn, to what happened in Brazil, the significance right up through, that was January 8th, January 6th, what happened in the United States, the insurrection. <clears throat> I was shocked and appalled when I saw the news coming through that um, uh, straight after President Lula da Silva had been uh, inaugurated as president, the Bolsonaro supporters tried to invade the um, presidential offices and federal government offices and try and stage a coup against an elected president. The response of the majority of people in Brazil was to condemn it, and hundreds of thousands of people immediately went on demonstrations in support of President Lula. We had a whiff of that on election day itself. I was in Sao Paulo and we were watching the electoral process there and within the city of Sao Paulo it was fine, but we were hearing reports from the rural areas and other parts of Brazil, particularly the northeast, which is a very strongly Lula supporting area, that there were attempts to prevent people getting to the polling stations to impede their progress and uh, we were very well aware of the strength of um, Bolsonaro supporters in trying to damage the democratic process. Lula won the election, and there are no complaints about the electoral process at all that I've heard. And we can see now what the right in Brazil are doing against Lula. The death of those poor people who were defending their land against um, illegal logging and ranches in the Amazon region is just a, a whiff of the problems that that government faces. But I think we have to say thank you to Lula for winning the election. Thank you to the landless people, the homeless people, the favela dwellers, and all the people that have done so badly out of inequality in Brazil, because of inequality in Brazil, for supporting Lula. And we need to support him to carry through that program of social and economic and environmental justice.
And finally, Peru, we have about 30 seconds, but if you can respond to the imprisonment and the ouster, uh, the coup against the leftist Pres president, Pedro Castillo. President Castillo was elected the president of Peru as a um, somebody to help bring about uh, proper quali quality of life and justice within Peru. He's now been removed by a coup. He should be freed from prison. He's, there's no business being in prison at all. And we should support those people that are demonstrating for justice and equality in Peru. The events in the center of Peru, in uh, Lima, with the killing of so many people, are absolutely appalling and disgusting. I discussed this with many people yesterday. We need urgent observation delegations to go to Peru to report, as you are, on your excellent channel, the truth of what is happening there. The people of Peru deserve democracy, not autocracy. Well, Jeremy Corbyn, we want to thank you for being with us. Member of the British Parliament, served as Labour Party leader from 2015 to 2020. He's taking part in today's Belmarsh Tribunal in Washington, D.C., along with Noam Chomsky, Pentagon Papers whistleblower Daniel Assange, um, Katrina Vanden Heuvel, publisher of The Nation, uh, Daniel Ellsberg, and more. I'll be co-chairing that panel, and democracynow.org will be live streaming the tribunal from the National Press Club at 2 p.m. Eastern. Anyone can join. Coming up, we go to Atlanta, where the battle over a new police training center has turned deadly as police fatally shot a forest defender protesting plans to build what's known as Cop City. Stay with us. Crosby, Stills and Nash, David Crosby, has died at the age of 81. To see our interview with him, go to democracynow.org. I'm Amy Goodman. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. In Atlanta, Georgia, calls are growing for an independent investigation into the police killing of an activist Wednesday during a violent raid on an encampment of protesters opposed to the proposed $90 million cop city training facility in a public forest. Law enforcement officers, including a SWAT team, were clearing protesters who'd occupied a wooded area outside the center when police claimed they were fired on and fired back. Police say a Georgia state trooper was wounded by gunfire. Activists have now released the name of the victim of the police shooting, longtime activist Manuel Tehran, who went by the name Tortuguita. In an audio statement sent to Democracy Now! Thursday, an Atlanta forest defender describes what happened and who Tortuguita was. They asked to remain anonymous and for their voice to be distorted for security reasons. On Wednesday, January 18th, multiple police departments descended upon Wilani People's Park in unprecedented numbers and force. They blocked access to the park on both roads and bike trails. Some people were arrested for attempting to document police actions that day at the park. Gunfire was heard at 9.04 a.m. About a dozen shots fired in rapid succession, followed by a loud boom about a minute later. For hours after the murder of Tortuguita, police continued to hunt, assault, and arrest our brave forest defenders. Those defenders and trees were targeted with pepper bullets. One tree sitter had their tree house, which stored food and water, cut from beneath them. They were left without food and water for over 12 hours up in the tree, 
as police waited at the base of the tree to capture them. This same tree sitter continued to stay in their tree until the next morning when they were arrested. Other forest defenders were chased by police dogs. These defenders had to hide and flee for their lives, all the while with the nauseating knowing that their dear comrade had been murdered in the sacred land that we call home. Tortuguita was a radiant, joyful, beloved community member. They fought tirelessly to honor and protect the sacred land of the Wilani forest. They took great joy in caring for each and every person that they came across. Tortuguita brought an indescribable jubilance to each and every moment of their life. Their passing is a preventable tragedy. The murder of Tortuguita is a gross violation of both humanity and of this precious earth which they loved so fiercely. Do not turn away from this violence. Do not allow the callousness of the police state to numb your heart. Honor Tortuguita by bravely witnessing the ongoing injustices the police and corporations are enacting upon the Wilani forest. Honor Tortuguita's legacy by embodying their joyous bravery. Tortuguita's presence on this earth is a gift that will keep on giving for generations to come. It is time for people to join this movement and to say no to this pointless escalation by the police. That was an anonymous statement by an Atlanta forest defender sent to Democracy Now!, his voice disguised. Vigils for the slain forest defender Tortuguita have taken place from Los Angeles to Minneapolis to Charlotte to Chicago and Atlanta. Activists held a vigil the night of the shooting and are planning a march on Saturday. For more, we go to Atlanta to speak with Kamau Franklin, founder of the organization Community Movement Builders. Kamau, welcome back to Democracy Now! Can you please tell us what you understood happened? Well, we have very little information on what took place besides uh, uh, what your uh, earlier recording just said, that uh, the only version of events that's really been released to the public has been the police version, the police narrative, which we should say the corporate media has ran away with. Uh, to our knowledge so far, we find it uh, 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 less than likely that the police version of events is what really happened. Uh, the idea that he was sitting in a tent and fired out of the tent at basically a SWAT team, uh, DeKalb County Police, Atlanta Police, and Georgia State Troopers, who were there in great numbers uh, to do the raid that they conducted in the, in the park. Um, and the idea is that this person shot and then they fired back. Um, as uh, the, the little intel that we have, residents said that they heard a blast of gunshots all at once, um, and not one blast and then a return of fire. Uh, also, there's been no other information released. We don't know how many times this young person was hit with bullets. We don't know the areas in which this person was hit. We don't know if this is potentially a friendly fire incident. Um, all we know is what the version of the police has give, have given. And that's why we're calling for an independent investigation, not one that's done by the Georgia uh, Bureau of Investigation, not one that's done by any federal authority, but a complete independent investigation. Because uh, that's the only way we're going to know what really happened. But right now, based on what we do know, we cannot say anything uh, except that this is probably a political assassination. Um, this is something that could have been prevented. There is no reason for them to take the tactics that they did in terms of going into the forest uh, with weapons in hand, with pepper spray, with live ammunition to go shoot. Um, forest defenders who were engaging in civil disobedience and direct action politics. Come out, Franklin, can we step back and talk about what Cop City, proposed Cop City is, and why people are encamped there? Cop City is an idea that came uh, after the 2020 uprisings by the city of Atlanta, the Atlanta Police Department, and the Atlanta, um, um, uh, the Atlanta Foundation, Atlanta Police Foundation. Uh, the idea, basically, is that uh, they want to develop a militarized police base that's right next to uh, a black and brown working-class community. And by building this space, they want to cut down over 100 acres of forest. 
Uh, they want to develop an area where there's a, a room for explosive testing, explosives testing, uh, over 12 firing ranges, a place where there's a Black Hawk helicopter landing pad, a training center for them to practice uh, crowd control. We should also mention that they are engaged in international training with the Israeli police. Um, and so we think this, this project really is the beginning of a militarized police base here in Atlanta, which will be the largest facility of its kind in the country. And the reason for doing this, uh, coming out of the uprisings, we believe, is to stop movement politics and movement uh, building in Atlanta, to coordinate efforts across the country with other police departments, and now internationally, to stop movement building. And we think this is going to be further sort of terroristic action on black and brown communities by a, a, a police state, which is out of control at this particular stage. Kamau, you had a piece in uh, Truth Out, um, and I wanted to—it was headlined, MLK's vision lives on in Atlanta's fight against new police training facility. Interestingly, in 2021, the city of Atlanta announced plans, uh, you know, for Cop City, saying it was to carry on the city's civil rights legacy of Martin Luther King and others. Can you talk about this? Yeah, I mean, we live in a dystopia where the, the, le the, the legacy of Dr. King is being used uh, by city officials, the same city officials who say that they love Good Trouble, they love John Lewis, they love Dr. King. When Dr. King was alive, Dr. King was working against police brutality and police militarization. Dr. King poignantly stated that the police themselves harass and are open to and conduct raids on communities. Obviously, Dr. King was surveilled by the FBI, um, a local police task force, along with federal police task force. Um, they harassed Dr. King. They sent a letter to Dr. King to kill himself. Um, and so these tactics, in different ways, continue today. The Cop City uh, uh, Task Force, which is developed between the FBI, the DeKalb County Police Department, the Atlanta Police Department, um, and several other agencies, Homeland Security, is basically a task force to stop out movement activity, because they're afraid that the, the protesters, the various types of protests that are happening, are getting the word out that no one has asked for Cop City. Any survey that's been done has shown that 70 percent of Atlantans have been against the building of this facility, but yet they went ahead and decided to build it anyway. And now that there's a protest movement against it, they're using all actions, all, 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 everything in their cap uh, capability and capacity to stop this movement. And now they've turned to the idea of actually murdering protesters as a way to stop people from going into the forest and to stop the defenders from defending the forest. Uh, last December, the Atlanta Forest defender Tortuguita, who was shot dead by police this week, was featured in an article headlined The Forest for the Trees that was written by David Peisner, published on The Bitter Southerner. In the piece, Tortuguita says, quote, we get a lot of support from people who live here, and that's important because because we win through nonviolence. We're not going to beat them at violence, but we can beat them in public opinion, in the courts even. They're also quoted saying, this is my home now. We've built a nice community here. It's about reclaiming the parks and public space. Um, the Atlanta Community Press Collective also wrote, Tortuguita, quote, spent their time between Atlanta, defending the forest from destruction and coordinating mutual aid for the movement, and Florida, where they helped build housing in low-income communities hit hardest by the hurricane. They were a trained medic, a loving partner, a dear friend, a brave soul, and so so much more. In Tort's name, we continue to fight to protect the forest and stop Cop City with love, rage, and a commitment to each other's safety and well-being. Finally, Kamau, if you can talk about where this protest stands now, did the police succeed in completely clearing the encampment, or are people still there? To our knowledge, there are still people who have access to the forest who occasionally will go in. We think, obviously, this is a dangerous time, because the police tactics have stepped up to the point where they're actually using live ammunition to shoot and kill protesters. Um, but for even with that said, 
we will continue to protest both in the forest, around the forest, and in the larger city of Atlanta. And again, asking for not only national support, but international solidarity on this issue, which we've gotten so far, which we expect only to step up more in the coming days and months. This protest movement is not over. It is not defeated. Uh, in the memory of the young, a young person who was killed, we will continue to fight. And let's remember also there was over a dozen arrests yesterday. There are more people charged with domestic terrorism. With domestic um, terrorism? Yes, the more charges of domestic terrorism. The interesting thing is that they charge the people from out of town, the people who are not Atlanta residents, with domestic terrorism, but they so far have not charged, and it's the latest round, they have not charged people who are arrested who are from the city with the charge of domestic terrorism. So we obviously think, again, these are scare tactics. These are tactics meant to criminalize the movement against Cop City. And what's really, really important that we have to keep hammering home is that this this task force or this, this uh, idea about what's happening, this criminalization of movement politics, is something that's being done with li so-called moderate liberal Democrats in Atlanta, and now a right-wing Republican, uh, who is the governor of the state of Georgia, who's now somehow taking the lead in criminalizing and calling protesters names. Um, but this is done together as a collaboration between the Atlanta uh, political establishment and the governor of Georgia. Um, and they're using all of their security forces, again, the Atlanta police, the Cap County police, state troopers, in conjunction with the FBI and even Homeland Security, to criminalize and, and uh, this movement and now to kill a young activist. You're talking about Governor Brian Kemp. Kamau Franklin, I want to thank you so much for being with us, the founder of the organization Community Movement Builders. And we'll link to your piece at democracynow.org and co continue to follow um, this encampment and the series of protests. Next up, we speak with Black Lives Matter co-founder Patrice Cullors about the death of her 31-year-old cousin, Keenan Anderson. He was a 10th grade English teacher who died after being repeatedly tased by police. Stay with us. If I had ever been it before, I would probably know just what to do. Don't you? If I had ever been it before, on another time around the wheel, I would probably know just how to deal with all of you. And I feel like I've been here before. Feel Deja Vu, performed by Crosby, Stills, Nash and Young is written by David Crosby, who has died at the age of 81. To see our interview with him and Graham Nash, you can go to democracynow.org. This is Democracy Now! I'm Amy Goodman. A warning to our audience, the story contains graphic descriptions of police violence in Los Angeles, California, where officers recently killed three men within 48 hours. On January 2nd, officers gunned down a black man named Takar Smith in his home after responding to his wife's call for assistance when he experienced a mental health crisis. On January 3rd, officers shot and killed a Latinx man named Oscar Sanchez, who was also facing a mental health crisis after they said he stepped toward them with a threatening metal object. On the same day, a 31-year-old black 10th-grade English teacher and father named Keenan Anderson died after being repeatedly tased. The Los Angeles Police Department has released video showing officers tackling Anderson in the middle of an intersection after they responded to a traffic accident as he begged for his life, saying, they're trying to George Floyd me. It shows an officer electrocuted. Anderson, uh, the, it showed the officer electrocuting Anderson with a taser for nearly 30 straight seconds as several others pin him to the ground face first. He was then tased again. Police say he died four hours later after suffering a cardiac arrest. Los Angeles' new mayor is Karen Bass. She's called the footage of Anderson and the two fatal shootings this month deeply disturbing. Anderson's sister, Dominique Anderson, spoke Tuesday at a news conference outside Los Angeles City Hall. 
If you continue to blame the victim and not hold officers accountable, why would they ever stop killing us? For more, we go to Los Angeles, where we're joined by Keenan Anderson's cousin, Patrice Cullors. Yes, Patrice Cullors, co-founder of Black Lives Matter and founder of Reform LA Jails, educator, abolitionist, author of When They Call You a Terrorist, a Black Lives Matter memoir, and an abolitionist handbook, 12 Steps to Changing Yourself and the World. Patrice, I want to start off with our deepest condolences to you and your family on the death of Keenan. Thank you. Thank you very much, Amy. Can you tell us what happened, what you understood took place? <clears throat> well, on January 5th, I was notified by one of my cousins that Keaton had passed. But on January 6th, another cousin sent me a NBC article um, naming Keenan as a suspect. Uh, it was obviously the LAPD press release that was um, offered to news stations um, and that my cousin had been tased and then died four and a half hours later. Um, in that text message, my cousin said, Patrice, the cops killed our cousin. And uh, the last two weeks have been a nightmare. Um, it's felt like all the years of fighting police violence and officer-involved shootings or officer-involved killings have, has now reached my doorstep. And um, many of us at the local level are calling on our elected officials to uh, change the way they deal with traffic stops. We believe there should be no cops at traffic stops. Um, but more importantly, my family's grieving our loved one, someone who was a giant to us, someone who was not just um, Keenan Anderson. He was my cousin. He was a sibling. He was um, a mentor to school. Uh, to to his students and and so much more. So, can you tell us about um, as you see it reconstructed? And I also want to ask what you think, Patrice, of the video being shown of Keenan being tased repeatedly. Well, you know, our many of our family members saw the video before it went live to the public, and um, it's heavily edited. So one of the things we want is the unedited footage. Um, there's no context in that video. My cousin had just gotten to a car accident. Um, and so uh, obviously, if you've ever been in a car accident, you're, you're, you're disoriented. Um, and so there's a lot of context that's missing. But then I think those last few minutes of the video of him being tased, um, obviously to death, was probably the most disturbing for me um, to witness, because it's like he knows they're trying to kill him. And he yells out, they're trying to George Floyd me, and they did. And that imagery of him, um, those last minutes of his life are are very painful to, to hear and, and visualize. And, um, and 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 think about given that he was such a beloved human being, um, to no no human being deserves to die in fear, um, to die um, publicly humiliated and without their dignity. You have questioned why it was necessary for armed police to show up at a collision. Um, the Guardian newspaper cites national data that shows roughly 10 percent of killings by police each year start with a traffic encounter, Patrice. That's correct. I, I couldn't help but think about Philando Castile um, and how he would be alive right now if he wasn't stopped. Um, at a at a, a four traffic stop by a cop, I think about so many other black people like Sandra Bland, who would be alive right now. My cousin, Keenan Anderson, who would be alive right now. Um, we have to reevaluate the use of police at traffic stops um, here in Los Angeles. We're pushing our mayor and our city council to uh, really identify a new source of uh, professionals that are not armed, that are trained in crisis, to respond to traffic stops. So can you lay out 
all your five demands uh, that you are making right now, and also the significance of the mayor being Karen Bass. Yes, um, Mayor Bass uh, obviously has a long history um, in Los Angeles, California. She's from South LA. She started, you know, one of the largest um, South LA-based organizations, Community Coalition. Um, I, I uh, knocked for her as she ran for assembly. Um, and then eventually became a congresswoman woman. And then she's worked, you know, uh, alongside many of us activists. She's uh, always been accessible. And, you know, she fought a hard campaign against Rick Caruso. And uh, we are grateful that Mayor Bass is our mayor. And I think um, now that she's the mayor, it, it's time for her and, and, and the rest of the city council to... Um, reduce the budget of the police. LAPD, we know, has receives um, billions of dollars um, through the city. And also, um, let's take this moment and not let Keenan die in vain. Um, we should have another opportunity to say the police killed somebody at a traffic stop. We should be looking at where can we, where can the city find dollars to specifically make sure that a cop is not the one responding to minor infractions that happen in the city of Los Angeles. That is the primary demand that I want to lift up um, to your audience, um, because I think it's an important moment right now. Uh, and I think it could be a national demand that many of us call on our local electeds to stop police officers at, um, um, to stop the use of police officers at traffic stops. Uh, but people can sign our petition. We have a color of change petition, um, tinyurl.com, uh, um, and it's uh, at the end of it is Keenan Anderson. And those are where you could find our five demands at the local level. We'd love for people to sign it um, nationally. But on this broadcast, um, the primary demand I want to lift up is the use of police at traffic stops. Um, and in L.A., uh, you have uh, city council members filing a motion to create an office of unarmed response. Another council member called for an expansion of the LAPD's mental evaluation unit and domestic abuse response team. And finally, um, if you could leave us with a description of who Keenan was. Um, Keenan was a mentor. He was more than a school teacher. He created programs for young people. Um, he worked alongside his colleagues to make sure his students were taken care of, not just academically, but also emotionally, um, also uh, physically. You know, I've heard so many stories. If he saw a young person that needed shoes, he would go and buy them shoes. He was always thinking about his young young people. He was a father. My cousin was a father. He was a beloved family member. And he um, will be missed um, is an understatement. Well, Patrice Cullors, again, our deepest condolences, cousin of Keenan Anderson, who died after being tased by police uh, in Los Angeles. Patrice Cullors is co-founder of Black Lives Matter and a founder of Reform LA Jails. Her books include When They Call You a Terrorist, Black Lives Matter Memoir, and An Abolitionist Handbook, 12 Steps to Changing Yourself and the World. And again today at 2 p.m. Eastern Time, Democracy Now! will be live streaming the Belmarsh Tribunal uh, that is being held as pressure is growing on President Biden to drop charges against Julian Assange. He's being held in the Belmarsh prison in London, has been held for almost four years. Among those who will be testifying are Noam Chomsky, um, as well as um, Daniel Ellsberg. Uh, ben Wisner will also be there, the uh, loss, the ACLU lawyer for Ed Snowden, Katrina Vanden Heuvel, the publisher of The Nation magazine. Um, I will be co-chairing uh, the Belmarsh Tribunal. Again, you can watch it at democracynow.org at 2 Eastern Standard Time. I'm Amy Goodman. Thanks so much.